Hello everybody and welcome to today's video. It's a continuation in the series where I asked 75 examiners to give me their one top tip for GCSE English Language and Literature and we're going through the results in this series of videos. Last week we looked at the English language answers so make sure you have a look at that and today we're looking at English Literature. So the first thing we're going to look at is answer the question. Let's have a look at these comments. Answer the question as in don't just write everything you know about the text. Answer the question, remember what you've learned, but answer the question. And this last one, use keywords from the question throughout your answer, has to be relevant. So here's the thing that often happens. You get into the exam, let's just talk about the poetry, for example. You open the paper and you see the named poem. Now let's just say you're studying power and conflict and the named poem is The Charge of the Light Brigade by Alfred Tennyson. Now what happens is your instinct is to think, oh, I know something great about this poem. I know about the use of dactylic dime but how it breaks in the line someone had blundered and how the word blundered is so important because it was in the initial war report that Tennyson read and how that is subtly criticizing the fact that the soldiers died for no reason all that kind of thing now what happens is we have those ideas and we think I want to write that in my answer but as is so clearly stated in these comments from the examiners the question is key you have to answer the question this is not an exam that says tell me everything you know about this text tell me everything clever you've learned about this poem it's an exam which says answer the question and unfortunately even if you know something really really clever if you cannot link it to what the question is asking there really is no point in bringing it in and we see a good way to help you with this in the last comment here use key words from the question throughout your answer this is one of the ways to help you make sure you don't drift off track into writing about something that you want to write about but isn't relevant to the question use the wording of the question so if the question is asking about the reality of war for example then you can continually use that phrase the reality of war in your answer paragraph by paragraph to make sure that you're not drifting off the question the second one is about the conceptualized response and if you watch my videos you'll know about this conceptualized responses in both lit papers conceptualize your answer if you can find the big idea and link your analysis to it so what is a conceptualized response it's an idea that runs throughout the entire answer a hypothesis a theory which you explore throughout the entire exam answer what it is not is an answer which has maybe four or five totally separate ideas which aren't in any way cohesive but just kind of random paragraphs that you know don't flow together at all so what this means is you look at the question and you try to think of a theory that you can explore in answer to that question and I go through this in relation to the poetry in my video which power and conflict poems compare well which love and relationships poems compare well but you can for example pair up the poems in such a way that it'll give you this sort of two-part line of argument that you can explore really well in about 45 minutes so let's say you're comparing Ozymandias and My Last Duchess and there's a question on power we can start by saying that both present the people in the poem as powerful but then go on to undermine that power that would be the line of argument and you'd spend half of your answer showing how they are presented as powerful how in Ozymandias there's the sonnet form which suggests his love for himself perhaps how the religious language of King of Kings is used to show how he sees himself as godlike and then in My Last Duchess the dramatic monologue form this idea that there is a speaker speaking to a silent listener who remains silent throughout and that shows that he is powerful and controlling the conversation the iambic pentameter the tight control of the meter of the poem might suggest power and that would be about half of your answer and then the next half would be but how is that power undermined so you might look at how in Ozymandias the sonnet form changes as the poem progresses which suggests a lack of control a lack of power how things change over time and similarly of course how the statue itself crumbles away reflecting in the lack of power Ozymandias has. In My Last Duchess, the fact there's enjambment and one long sprawling stanza suggests a lack of control over what he's saying. He's just sort of blurting it all out and perhaps that suggests a lack of power as well. And that would be your two-part line of argument. And by the time you've explained all of those points with references to the texts and analysed them, you know, that's going to take you about 45 minutes. To get those top marks, a conceptualised response is a line of argument, a hypothesis, a theory, which you explore throughout the entire answer. Next up, a simple one, but it got a lot of likes, 17 likes. Don't write about the film. 
And I asked this person, does this still happen? And they said, yes, in particular with the new version of An Inspector Calls. So you have to remember that films are different to the text in some way. And that's okay because they're not trying to be exactly like the text, but it's not good then to write about them in the exam. In an ideal world, you shouldn't watch any of the film versions. It can help you in your sort of vague understanding of the plot and what the characters are like. But so often there's so many differences, you then need to put so much effort into kind of working out which which bits aren't in the text, so I mustn't write about them. And what happens is a lot of people write about things in the exam that aren't even in the text because they've seen them in a film version. So if you're going to watch film versions, make sure you read the text and that you're very, very clear about what is just part of the film interpretation so that you don't write about it in the exam. And finally, we have a very heavily liked comment, become very, very proficient at embedding short and snappy quotations. Now, what does this mean? To embed a quotation means you take a quotation and you put it into your sentence so that when you read, it just flows as part of the sentence. And the idea of having short and snappy quotations, of course, means zooming in perhaps on one or two words or a key phrase to use as evidence in your answer. So I'm going to show you a paragraph that doesn't do this, and then I'm going to show you how you could change that paragraph to do it really well. Shakespeare uses religious language to show the power of Romeo's love for Juliet. Romeo tells Juliet, My lips, two blushing pilgrims, ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. Here there is religious language with the word pilgrims. A pilgrimage is a religious journey a person might make in order to visit a place of religious significance. By referring to his lips as pilgrims, Romeo is suggesting that Juliet is the religious shrine he wishes to worship. This presents the power of love, suggesting, and I've stopped the paragraph there. So what we can see here is the sort of thing so many students do. It's not a bad opening to a paragraph, of course, but the quotation is just so much longer than it needs to be. The analysis is on the word pilgrims, nothing else. So why quote the rest? Let me show you how you could embed this quotation. Shakespeare uses religious language to show the power of Romeo's love for Juliet. Juliet when Romeo refers to his lips as pilgrims. A pilgrimage is a religious journey, and on it goes. So essentially, I've just quoted the one word that I'm going to analyse. I don't need to quote anymore because I'm not analysing anymore. And what quite often happens as well is if you have a quotation which is really long, and then you say something like, here we see the use of emotive language, or here we see the use of religious imagery, the examiner's going to be thinking, well, which bit of it? The quotation's so long. So why not try to shorten your quotations and really focus on the word or phrase it is you're going to be analysing? So I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please subscribe and give the video a like. On screen are some of the videos I refer to throughout, and thanks for watching.